Welcome back everyone to another ESO build video. Today it's going to be the update to Cleave, the Stamina Sorcerer for the Harrow Storm DLC. Now the design of this particular build is to pump out as much area of effect as possible. However, this one has a little bit of a twist on the standard AoE setups. Most AoE setups have just really good area of effect and fairly decent single target damage, which this does have. However, the more stacked the enemies are, the more damage each enemy can do to each other and your main target. Meaning your single target damage on perhaps a boss or a primary target that you're trying to focus on will actually get higher and higher and higher the more adds you actually have. So this will be explained much, much later on when we get to the gear and such because obviously we'll be able to demonstrate that. But the more stacked the enemies are, the much stronger this character becomes. It's very much a kind of berserker type build and it does perform in crowded situations. Any, any one add in a fight will make a difference, but the more you've got the better. Now, first of all, we're going to go into the stats. We'll just make sure that we've got our potions and buffs and all that good stuff on. We are on 9.7k max magicka, 16k max health, and 31k max stamina with 2.3k recovery. You're on almost 4k weapon damage, which will actually go up in combat because of our setup. We are on 43% crit chance, but don't worry, that will actually go up in combat as well, um, especially if you have a Nightblade in your group. However, if you don't, then don't worry. There is a setup that will actually put it over 50%. And, of course, we're putting 28 points into max health and 36 into stamina. There's a very good reason for that. We're getting there in a moment. And we're using the Shadow Mundestone. You can change this if you really want to, but through all the tests, and this one actually did outperform, regardless of the fact that we've got low crit, it did help when we got to execute if we got those lucky crits in when we were trying to kill stuff. Most of the stuff we're using is actually flat damage, not crit, so it's not hugely essential, but it does actually close the gap a little bit when we do crit with our dots and such. And, of course, like I said, our execute. Now, we're using Lava Foot. This is no health bonus, just stamina and recovery, which is a very risky food to use. Of course, we're a stage 4 vampire as well. But that is why we've altered our attributes. We have allowed for the lack in health and made sure that we are still hitting 16k health and a decent amount of stamina. Now, if you do want to change your food, you can, and you can change it to this. It's basically your flat stuff. If you've got a stupid amount of recovery in your group, you can use this, or you could use Dubious Command Throne, or our Tam Takeaway Brock, whichever you prefer. Just bear in mind, of course, your recovery will have zero impact from your food with this food here. But if you use the other stuff, you will still gain a slight bonus to it. The choice is yours. Depends what content you're in. Depends on how active people are with synergies and buffs and bonuses and recovery and all that kind of stuff. You do have choices. But flat out, I use the Lava Foot stuff with a health change in our stats. However, if you do use this, you will, of course, have the same amount of stamina, but you've got to 22k health. Now here's your choice. You could stay that way and be just tanky as hell. Or you could, of course, take the health out and put it straight into stamina. And this will give you around 35, 36k. That's entirely up to you. Yes, of course, with the extra stamina bonus, you will hit harder. But you will, of course, lose your recovery. As you can see here, even with a potion running, we're on 1.4, not 2.3. So the choice is essentially yours. Failing that, of course, you can heavy attack because it does benefit you with the two-hander passes, which we're going to get to later. However... For a basic setup, we're actually using this stuff. You have options. Now, I'm going to go into the skills in detail. These are going to be explained where they come from, what morphs to take, why and how to use them. And, of course, if you do skip this, this is your choice. But if you do skip and ask questions in the comment section below that I've already answered, I won't be wasting my time or yours answering stuff that's already been explained. So, first of all, we are using Bound Armaments. This is in the Daedric Summoning skill line. Fifth ability you unlock starts off as Bound Armor Morpher to Bound Armaments. This has several different applications, but we're going to use it for one purpose overall, two purposes if we're changing our rotation. This is going to make more sense once we get there, but first of all, if you activate this, you will get 40 seconds worth of a buff. And every light attack you fire will count up to four and stack floating daggers around your character. When you activate it, that only lasts for 10 seconds, by the way. When you activate it, you will throw the daggers at the target. And each one will do physical damage, and each one will fire every 0.3 seconds. So all you need to do really is keep up your light attacks, and you can fire off these daggers. However, while slotted, this will also increase your maximum stamina by 8%, which is a pretty big boost to our flat stats. And on live right now, because this is on the PTS, and there are slight variations to light and heavy attacks at the moment, which is not valid for live server. 
on live, this also does increase your light attack damage by 10% as well. So if you keep up your light attacks and this active buff, you will get extra damage out of it. However, if you don't activate the daggers at all and you never use that part of it, you will still benefit from the flat stamina bonus and the flat light attack bonus. There are variations to this particular skill and how you do or don't use it inside the rotation, but that will come much later on in the video. Next up is Barb Trap, of course. is in the Fighter's Guild skill line. Starts off as Trap Beast. Morph it to Barb Trap. Last ability you unlock in the skill line. Very simply put, you put this on the ground. Once it catches a target in the trap, they are immobilized for a couple of seconds. However, if they can't be immobilized, they won't be. But whether they can be immobilized or not, you will still do the initial hit and the damage over time for 18 seconds. And for the duration of that damage over time, you will gain minor force, increasing all of your critical damage that you do by 10%. So any crits are all increased by this bonus. Keep it under a target at all times. Next is Carve. This is in a two-hander skill line. This is a very simple skill, but very, very vital to the, the overall setup. Third ability to unlock in the two-hander skill line, doesn't matter what two-hander type you're actually using. We are, of course, using an axe, but any that you're using will still work with this. This starts off as Cleave, morph it to Carve. This will do damage in front of you, in area of effect, and hit all targets for physical damage, but also attach a damage over time bleed to them. This is very important. You must use this at least once every rotation, and sometimes we're going to use it a lot more than that, but that, again, will make more sense once we get to the gear and the rotation. Next is Wreck and Blow. This is our main spammable. Now, we've chosen this morph on purpose. If you choose Dizzy and Swing, you will, of course, be able to self-apply off balance, which can make a substantial difference to your group. However, if you are with people that use my builds off my channel and you have an off-balance build or an Easy Sork in your group already, you are never going to need it because they've got that covered. So, for that purpose, we've chosen Wreck and Blow, and we can get a little bit more damage out of this because... As this is our main spammable and hits every 0.8 seconds, if you weave in your light attacks as well, you'll gain extra damage out of those because this will grant you Empower. Every time you fire a Wreck and Blow, your next light attack will be increased by 40%. Now here, it doesn't say that. It says increase the damage of your next fully charged heavy. This is irrelevant for the build right now. The 40% light attack is live. This heavy attack stuff is just in testing on PTS. So ignore that part. That is 40% increase to your next light attack. So Wreck and Blow, Light Attack, Wreck and Blow, Light Attack. Your Light Attacks will be stronger. And of course, this buffs your Light Attacks too. So the two work together. Now, that will make more sense when we get to the rotation as well. But just bear in mind, this grants in power for five seconds part. This is different on live. 40% to your Light Attack damage. Now next up is Reverse Slice. The fourth ability down in the two-hander skill line. Starts off as a Reverse Slash, morph it to Reverse Slice. Now, yes, the other morph does do more damage single target. However, we are not a single target build. We will take advantage of any single target we can, but we want to optimize our area of effect as much as possible. So, for the purpose of that, we've chosen this one. This particular morph, when the target goes below 50%, I wouldn't use this until about 25%, actually, maybe 30 you actually start escalating damage. So, you hit the target with this. Make sure you light attack weave in between, of course. And it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and deals up to 300% more damage depending on how low their health is. At the same time, however, other enemies take 78% damage of the damage inflicted on the main target. So, the harder you hit the main target, the more splash everybody else gets. And that's uncapped as well. You can hit as many as you like as long as they're close. This is an error of effect build and this is chosen on purpose. If you choose the other morph, you lose all splash damage, your AoE is nuked, and you just hit the single target instead. That's not what we want to do. So this is perfect. That also works alongside of our passives as well, which we're going to get to in a bit. Fighter's Guild uh, Ultimate, of course, for all this Dawnbreaker. You need Fighter's Guild 10 for this. But once you've got it, you will unlock Dawnbreaker, morph it to Flawless Dawnbreaker. Now this has a 0.4 second channel, so this cannot be bar swapped. If you try to bar swap it or cancel it or anything like that, it will just cancel the entire skill or you'll get stuck on the bar until it's finished doing what it's doing, depending on how quick you are with the buttons. Now, we don't really use this ultimate unless we pretty much have to. It's a bit of an emergency ultimate just to finish something off if we don't have enough ultimate for the back bar. But it does deal a healthy amount of damage. It does deal a good frontal AoE damage over time as well and it does increase your weapon damage by 300 for 20 seconds so perhaps at execute you might want to use this as often as you can to keep the weapon damage up to give you a much harder hit but for the rest of the fight we're going to use a different ultimate entirely 
But however, the choice is of course yours. This is primarily here for stats anyway, and we'll get to those in the passives. Back bar, of course. Bound Armaments is double barred. So we've got the stamina bonus and the light attack bonus on both bars. That's pretty straightforward. But if you choose to, if you want that extra bit of help, you can change this to a heal instead. And just benefit from it on the front bar. Just bear in mind, you will drop damage on the back. So make sure you're not on the back for too long. Now, if you do swap that out, you can, of course, put Echoing Vigor on. This is from the Assault skill line. Starts off as Vigor, Morpher to Echo and Vigor. You will need Alliance points to unlock this, but if you go into Battlegrounds, even if you suck eggs, it doesn't matter because every time you lose a fight, you will still gain Alliance points. So if you win the Battlegrounds, you'll get more. If you lose, you'll still get a prize anyway. So it's inevitable that you will unlock it. Anyway, this is a heal in area of effect that heals every 2 seconds for 10 seconds with a 15 meter radius, and they stack. So if you've got multiple stamina DPSs with you, or even a stam healer, who knows, um, and you... You fire this together, they will stack on top of each other, giving a massive heal to anyone caught inside of it. Now, you can choose the other morph if you prefer, but it won't heal your group. So, if you pick the selfish morph and you're in a situation where you want to stack multiple vigors, you won't be able to do it. This is chosen on purpose. Again, you don't have to have it. You can just stick with bound armaments. We do have heals covered anyway, but if you want the extra help, you can, of course, use this. Now, next up, of course, is Hurricane. This is very, very important for the build. This is in Stormcalling. It's the second ability to unlock. Starts off as Lightning Form, Morph it to Hurricane. Now, this will actually do physical damage and area of effect in a kind of an AoE circle. And it will grow every five seconds, increasing the damage and increasing the size. And it will last 15 seconds. So, this has three stages. Five seconds, 10 seconds, and then finishes at 15. Now, while you're in this form, you also gain Major Resolve, which will give you an increased physical and spell resistance of 5 to 8 zero, and your speed will be increased by 10% as well. So you're fast, you've got good resistances, and you're doing damage in area of effect. That is very important. Keep this up 100% of the time. Next is Razor Caltrops. This is in the Assault skill line. You, again, you will have to go to PvP for this. So if you get in Vigor, you're en route to get this anyway. Again, you don't have to win in Battlegrounds to get Alliance points. Even if you lose and someone's teabagging the hell out of you, raise a middle finger, doesn't matter. You're still getting points. Now, starts off as Caltrops, morph it to Razor Caltrops. This is incredibly important for this particular setup. Now, before we were using Poison Injection, you can still do that. But that depends on a certain weapon. So we will get to that in the gear. For now, for as much AoE as possible, we are using Razor Caltrops. It's really nice damage over time in a massive area of effect. It does damage every one second to all targets inside of it. And any enemies that stand inside of this will take um, a debuff in the form of Major Fracture. So they will reduce their physical resistances by 5280, making sure that it can all be hit harder. Now, if we're pumping out loads of physical area of effect damage, it's useless if all of the AoE targets are not debuffed with major fracture because we can't hit as hard as we could possibly hit there are buffs and debuffs in the games that stack on top of this of course but if we don't have this as a base or the tanks haven't taunted them quick enough our damage already isn't doing enough so we keep this up as much as possible any enemies that are damaged by this will have this four second debuff reapplied to them consistently if they leave the circle it will stay with them for four seconds if they stay in the circle every time they get hit by this damage they will make sure that this has 100 percent uptime on them now, this debuff itself will only affect six targets, but once that sixth or fifth or fourth or third target or whatever is dead, it can then apply to another one. So you can keep this up inside of an area of effect situation very, very well. It's really handy, not just in dungeons, but in trials as well. Now, this can get expensive. It's only 2.4k, which doesn't look like that much on paper, but if you're using it every 10 seconds, that can add up. So don't spam it unnecessarily. Make sure you let it last its full duration, and then when you come back to the back bar again, reapply it. Don't over spam it because it doesn't have its initial hit application anymore and hasn't had for quite some time. Next is Critical Surge. This is stupidly powerful. So if you don't have Vigor, and you don't have Caltrops at the moment then obviously, but if you don't have Vigor, do not worry for the time being. Critical Surge is in the Stormcalling skill line. Fourth ability to unlock starts off as Surge, morph it to Critical Surge. This costs Magicka, which is great for our sustain. We don't actually waste stamina using another buff. Lasts for 33 seconds and it will give you Major Sorcery and Major Brutality. Now, Brutality is the one we want, but we'll take the Sorcery anyway. And this increases your weapon and spell damage by 20%. And while this is active, you deal critical damage by chance, obviously with your skills. But if you do, you will heal for 3300. Any crit you do in any way, shape or form will heal you 
and this can happen once every second. That is stupidly overpowered, and yes, it can base off of healing receive bonuses and all that good stuff as well, so this can go way higher than 3.3. This can go into the regions of around 7 to 8k, depending on your champion points, depending on your group and what buffs and bonuses they do or don't bring. It's really powerful, but just bear in mind, of course, you must crit to apply this. We are going to crit indefinitely throughout the fight. We are going to have this every second, but if you don't have a target right now and you have a damage over time effect left on you, you obviously have nothing to hit to heal with. So that is in the situation of where you might want to put Vigor on your bar here, as we explained earlier. If you are in a fight and you've got lingering effects on you, you're going to want to heal. Hopefully someone's got you covered, but if not, if maybe you have solo or maybe VMA or something like that, you might want that extra slot on there or just to help your group in general. But for the most part, as long as you keep this up, it's pretty hard to kill you, especially alongside our resistance buff as well. Very powerful skill. Keep it up once every 33 seconds. It's not necessarily inside the rotation as such, but because it's got such a long duration, just make sure you don't let it fall off. Next up is Endless Hail. This is in the bow skill line. Second ability to unlock. Starts off as Volley Morph to Endless Hail. Now, this is done on purpose. Yes, Caltrops has got a 10 second duration, but this has got a 14 second duration. And it also has a 2 second delay. So, technically, it only does damage over 12. So, the other morph of this does do more damage, but it's got a much shorter time. It's got 8 seconds of damage and 10 seconds of the skill. So, this is guaranteed to run out versus Caltrops and Hurricane if we have the other morph and it makes our front bar rotation a bit tricky because we've got less damage every so often towards the end of it because it runs off too quickly endless hail however much much better on time and little less damage but fits into the rotation much much cleaner never runs out and of course razor caltrops pretty much lands when it should and this has got no gaps in it within reason sometimes if you're a bit slower with your rotation you might actually let it drop off but nowhere near as much as the other morph so I would highly recommend this particular one, and it does benefit us for our weapon choice as well. Very strong damage over time and area of effect. Make sure at all times you keep up Endless Hail, you keep up Caltrops, and you keep up this Hurricane. Because if you don't, the purpose of this build is going to be nuked. Make sure you keep these running. Now, the ultimate on the back bar is a choice of many. You could have Flawless Stormbreaker on both bars and just fire this throughout the fight and keep the passive bonus up, which we're getting to in the passives all the time if you want to. Now, you can choose a Storm Atronarch if you want. I know it does shock damage, but of course, this does scale off your highest resource. So, this does actually boost based on our stam, which is weird, but it does. Now, we don't have massive spell pen, so it's not going to be as strong as it is on a magic magical DPS. But it can benefit the group because they can take a synergy given the major Berserk for 8 seconds. And the, uh, the Storm Atro will gain that as well. So, that's quite helpful. However, if you are in lots of AoE situations, you want a rapidly fire and damage over time. This does do magic damage, but Suppression Field in the Dark Magic skill line is absolutely insane. Now, what this does is it lands on the group in a big, big dome, stuns everyone inside of it if they can be stunned for 12 seconds, and does damage over time. Now, the damage over time is magic damage, not physical, of course, so it's not going to scale off of our max resources, but the, the rate of fire that these ticks come in is extremely relevant for our sets. It fires every 0.5 seconds. Not one second, not two, 0.5. So every one second, you're getting two ticks out of it. When we get to the gear, it's going to make a lot more sense as to why this is a choice. Not to mention, of course, this is a, a massive CC. In oh shit situations where you could be overwhelmed by ads and there's stuns and heavy attacks and stuff going out everywhere, you can literally shut everything down. Choice of ultimate is obviously up to you. But this one I would highly recommend, especially in dungeons and vet dungeons and some trials as well where you need to shut down loads and loads of ads. Failing that, of course, the rate of fire that this actually ticks at is much more beneficial than you would think on the surface. But again, we're coming to the gear shortly. Now, passives. This reduces the health, magic, and stam cost of your abilities. You're going to want that. This one heals you if you do direct dark magic damage. We're not really using any at all, apart from the negate bubble, but it's not direct. So that one is irrelevant. This one will reduce the cost of your next ability, whether it be health cost, magical cost, or stamina cost, if you block an attack. So if you do block, next ability is cheaper, throw out something that's expensive. When you cast a dark magic ability, you grant your group minor prophecy, and yourself of course, increasing their crit rating by 1, 3, 2, 0 for 20 seconds. This increases everybody in the room's spell crit by 6%. That's actually really helpful. Now... We're not going to use that every 20 seconds because we don't use Dark Magic as such. But if you do fire ultimate, they will benefit from it. Daedric Summoning is somewhat important for some of the passives, but not all of them. This one is for pets. We're not using one. Even the Storm Atro doesn't count for this. 
and this one is for pets as well. We're not using one, doesn't count. These two, however, are relevant. This reduces your ultimate cost by 15%, and this increases your health and stamina recovery by 20% while you have a Daedric Summon and Ability slotted. We do have one, we have Bound Armaments, we have a 20% recovery bonus for both of those values for having that on the bar, and if you're not using Vigor, you have it on both bars. So we keep that all the time. Stormcorn, of course. This increases your mag recovery. We're going to need that. We are using one magic ability. Want to make sure we can use it. That's helpful. Um, increases your physical and shock damage. Increases your damage done against enemies by 1% for every 10% current health they have. This is confusing to some, but I'm going to explain it very clearly. The more health the enemy has, the harder you tend to hit. Except for execute, obviously, which is when your skills start hitting harder. Now, if they have 100% health, all of your damage is increased by 10%. If they have 90% health, all of your damage is increased by 9%. If they have 80, it's increased by 8, and so on and so forth. Down to 10% health left, and you'll do an additional 1% damage. So overall, you are always doing more damage than you would flat out. But the higher the health, the bigger the boost. The lower the health, the less useful it is. But during low health, we do, of course, take advantage of our execute bonuses and skills and all that good stuff. So we do get a 1% increase on that versus what anyone else would normally get. So, the higher the health, the bigger the burst. The lower the health, you still get a tiny bit anyway. This increases your weapon and spell damage by 2% for each sorcerer ability slotted. Currently, we've got a 2% bonus on the front bar because we have one skill here. On the back bar, 1, 2, 3, 4. We've got an 8% weapon damage bonus on this bar. Very handy indeed. Especially since on the bow bar, we're not using our main weapon. We're just putting our dots and um, AoEs down. So, we do get a nice boost there so we don't drop too much when we swap bars. Two-hander, of course, you're going to want every single one of these. Your light attacks and heavy attacks can damage up to three nearby targets. So if you hit one target in front of you, other enemies around will take splash damage. This on PTS currently says 25% because we're going through some changes. But on live, this is a 50% increase. So just bear in mind, that is something that you need to consider when you're watching this video. Live is slightly different right now, so you will actually get a bigger bonus at the moment. Um, this is very important. We are using an axe. This will grant you a chance to apply a massive bleed on enemies for taking melee damage. So any of your two-handed weapon abilities or our light attacks and heavy attacks can apply this if you're lucky. No cooldown. So you can just keep applying it if you're really lucky and if not, hopefully you'll get one in there somehow. And that will benefit us as well because we must have damage over time for this build. This reduces the cost of your two-handed abilities, of course. We want to get that down because we're spamming one. When you deal damage with a fully charged heavy attack, your next direct damage attack used within 7 seconds deals a 10% additional damage. So if you do need to heavy attack to get sustained back, don't worry, your next 2 hand ability will hit harder, if it's direct. Now, Carve has an initial direct bonus to it, so that works. Wreck and Blow, definitely direct, and our Execute is also direct. So if you heavy attack, execute, heavy attack, execute, you hit a little bit harder. It's a little bit slower, but you hit harder. Increases your stamina recovery by 30% for 10 seconds after killing a target. If you kill something, you get a big stam bonus. Recovery, in, in fact. This is really, really helpful. It kind of allows you to stay in that berserker mode and just keep hitting and hitting and hitting. Now, we are using a bow, of course. You are going to want these bonuses. This will give you a damage bonus of up to 12% for enemies that are further away from you with your bow ability. So if you're on the run-up, you're using volley or whatever. On the run into a fight, or even if you're in and out in mechanics, you'll get a bigger bonus for longer range. This increases your weapon crit rating while being on that bar. This reduces the stam cost of bow abilities. Of course, they're expensive. This will give you a stacking bonus of 5%, up to 25%, in fact, because it stacks five times, for your bow ability damage, as long as you apply light and heavy attacks. If you apply light or heavy attacks, each one will give you an additional stack, and the duration is five seconds per hit. So if you're running um, a light attack now and it hits with a five-second bonus, the next light attack will restart the timer, basically, and continue to do so until you stop light attacking with your bow. This will, of course, happen. It will run off because we're mostly on our front bar. But we will benefit from the small bonus while we're on the back and then carrying over until it runs out anyway. Keep up your light attacks. This grants you major expedition for dodge rolling. Don't dodge roll too often because obviously there is a penalizing effect. So if you dodge roll too close to a previous one, your cost will go up and up and up. So be careful with that. But if you do dodge roll while on the bow bar, you will get a speed bonus. And we've already got a speed bonus with our Hurricane anyway, and they do stack. Now, we are not using light armor, and we are not using heavy armor. However, if you do choose to go with the 511 setup, which is an alternative version of the build, if you don't have all the shinies, you will, of course, want the first three 
in heavy armor and the first three in light armor for those small bonuses. But since we're not technically using them on the overall setup, unless you choose to change stuff, we'll avoid these for now. Medium armor, of course, you're going to want all of them because we're using seven medium. This will increase your crit rating per piece. This will increase your stam recovery and reduction to cost per piece. This will reduce your sneak cost and your sneak detection radius, which is okay in some content. Maybe you want it, maybe you don't. Depends if you've got the spare skill points. This will increase your weapon damage by 15% for five pieces worn. And this will increase your movement speed while sprinting and reduce the cost of dodge roll. So these are essential skills. You must get every single one of them, especially agility. Now we're a stage four vampire. Stage two or higher, you will actually benefit from this passive, giving you a 10% increase to mag and stam recovery, which is why our stam recovery is so high. And of course you get undeath. The lower your health under 50%, the less damage you take. So you get tankier and tankier, the lower your health goes and you take less and less damage. You don't have to be a stage 4 if you don't want to be, but I personally choose to be. I use it in all content on all of my characters except for the werewolf I have, and I don't struggle. If you get killed in fire too much, it's because you're standing in it too much. Most fire will one-shot a DPS or a healer anyway, regardless of whether you're a vampire or not, because fire is some of the hardest hitting stuff in the game. Just make sure you're paying attention to the mechanics, and be careful. Failing that, if you don't want to be a vampire, you don't have to be, you'll just lose out on these passives. So you'll probably die more often, and you'll have less recovery. But that is a choice, and it is entirely up to you. Fighters Guild, of course, these are very important. Intimidating Presence reduces the cost of these abilities, so Barb Trap is cheaper. This increases your weapon damage by 6% for each Fighters Guild ability slotted. So, we've got 3% here, and 3% here. This is why it's here for passives, unless you want to actively use it. Yes, of course, if you had it on the back bar, that would work there as well. But we've got 8% on here already. If you take off this 2% and replace it with a 3, you're not up by much. And we want to take advantage of Suppression Field as much as possible anyway. Again, that's your choice. This one is incredibly essential. You generate 9 ultimate when you kill Undead, Daedra, or Werewolf. We are going to do an abundance of area of effect. We've got loads of explosions going off. We are going to get a lot of kills. This will dramatically increase your ulti regen and allow you to spam this more often, which when we get to the gear is going to show you why we're going to have so much area of effect power. This is very important. Make sure you get it. This increases the damage of your Fighter's Guild ability versus Undead, Daedra, or Werewolf. You're going to fight an abundance of those. Your Beast Trap is going to be stronger versus them. And of course, your Dawnbreaker if you choose to use it. Undaunted is incredibly important. If you take a Synergy, you get 4% of all three of your Magic, Stamina, and Health Bars back. Just for taking the Synergy. Ignore whatever that Synergy does. That's a bonus. Just for taking them, you get stuff back. Now, there is a Synergy video in the description below over explaining the importance of synergies and what you should and shouldn't do and how you can fit them inside your rotation without slowing down because i know there's some information out there saying synergies slow down your rotation and lessen your dps they do not that is down to the player and down to timing that is all explained in the video but i can't stress how important it is for you to take synergies especially if you're one of those people that whinges about your sustain if you're in ignoring those four synergies that just went past you you just lost out on a potential 16 percent resources that's why you can't sustain. Take the synergies. Plus, every single synergy in the game benefits you or your group, no matter what. This increases your max health, stamina, and magicka by 2% per type of armor worn. But since we're using one type of armor, we only take one of the bonuses, not all three. So we've got a 2% across the board. Again, that will make more sense once we get to the gear. Orc, of course, is our race of choice. You do not have to have Orc. However, if you choose any other race... Bear in mind that you may need to change your stats and attributes to balance out what you are missing. And this is what you would be missing. Now, we get 2k max stamina, which is really nice. We get 1k max health. That is essential for your race choice, by the way. If you choose something else, bear in mind what health you may or may not have. You might have to wiggle some stuff. If we do damage with a weapon ability, we heal for 600, which can crit and does scale off of our healing received as well. And that happens once every four seconds. That doesn't just mean you're two-hander, by the way. That means your, your dot from your two-handers, your bleed from your axe, potentially, your light attacks, your heavy attacks, your skills, your bow skills, your volley, anything like that can heal you. So we're really, really um, good on the whole get in, do damage, and survive side of things, especially when it comes to using crit surge at the same time, because they stack, they're not going to cancel each other out we can stay in the face of the enemy hit stuff really hard and heal for the privilege and of course we've got high weapon damage and fast movement speed so we are a full-out berserker now alchemy is the most important skill line for this passive in my opinion this increases the duration of your potions by 30 percent we're using crafted potions for brutality yes i know we have that in crit surge but we're using that for the heal primarily we have major savagery and we have major endurance all in our potions 
they last 47 seconds instead of what would potentially be about 36. The cooldown is 45, which means we have 100% uptime on our potion if we keep using it. Tip, do not just use a potion when you're low. That's a really bad way to use potions. Use them 100% of the time. They are consumable buffs. Do not let them run out. Now we're going to get into the gear and there are some choices here. However, the main setup, of course, is going to be your most optimal choice. Now, we are using the Master's Battle Axe on the front bar in Sharpened. This is also using Double Dot Poison, so we can get two damage over time effects on the single target. Damage over time is essential for this build. As much area of effect damage over time as possible, but if we get more on the single target, so be it. Now, this increases the direct damage of Cleave and... It can stack depending on how many targets there are. So your carve effect, your, your swing in front of you, our main ability that gives the damage over time. This will actually get stronger on the initial hit per target. And this will stack up to 9k additionally per hit. So basically this will get stronger depending on how many targets are in front of you up to 6. 6 or more this will cap at 9k increase to the base hit. So in those situations, that's when you want to spam it. This is very, very strong in area of effect for that flat damage hitting stuff. And we will be using this. The back bar weapon is the Maelstrom Bow. And this has an infused weapon and spell damage increase glyph on it. And this increases the strength of our volley or endless hail. We're doing a lot of area of effect damage. Every single tick gets stronger and stronger and stronger. This is going to help a lot. These two weapons are your optimal choice. However, if you don't have them, it's not the end of the world. We're going to get to your choices and change outs that you can do in a moment. We're using a Zerblite on five pieces. You must, of course, have this on the body or the jewelry or any combination of the two. And you must have it all the time. Hence why our weapons are not the sets. We can keep this on us all the time. We don't need a monster set. This will give you a weapon crit bonus, a stam bonus, a stam recovery bonus. And when you deal damage with a damage over time effect, you apply a stacking um, bonus for five seconds of blight seed and every damage over time that you apply to this will basically start the uh the timer again now when you stack up to 20 stacks so every tick of any damage over time will add one stack with no cooldown you can literally rapidly stack these once you get to 20 stacks it will explode in air of effect and all enemies inside of it will take that damage now each enemy can have only one stack on them at a time and once it goes boom it can't be affected again for more than for two seconds so this stacks on multiples with a two second cooldown per target so if you stack this on one target it goes boom and everyone around you gets hit as well however if it stacks on two targets both of them go boom and both of them hit every target around them including each other if you have it on three four five 10 15 targets each one can go boom and each one will blow each other up you are turning your ads and your main targets into a bomb so if you're hitting single target this is a nice explosion if you have an ad in the room you've now got two explosions if you have three ads in the room you've now got four explosions because you've got the boss as well and each one of these will increase the damage on that target so your single target damage escalates the more adds are in the room. So if you've got a good tank that can stack everything together, you are going to annihilate things. And I'm going to demonstrate this when we get to the rotation as well. I'm going to show you how to kill 14 target skeletons quicker than most people can kill one. This is absolutely insane. Your tank must stack stuff together or you must take advantage of clusters of enemies. Now, the next set we're using is, of course, Aegis Caller. Now, there are choices here too. This gives you weapon damage, stam recovery, and weapon damage. So we've got lots of flat here. Not so much crit, which is great because we're doing procs anyway, which don't crit. And we've also got a nice uh, stam recovery bonus on both sets. This, when you deal critical damage with a melee ability, which we will, summons a lesser Aegis, which is a, a minion spinning. And for 11 seconds, after the first 2.5 of it spawning, the lesser Aegis will spin, doing damage, bleed damage in fact, to all targets within its area, every one second and this can happen every 12 seconds we've got a one second cooldown a 2.5 second wind up but during its time in the room 
it will spin and spin and spin and do damage over time to every single target it can reach. And this makes Azure Blight stack extra ticks. So when I said this needs damage over time ticks to fire, just bear in mind that although there's a two second cooldown, this can proc very, very fast. So this Aegis set can do damage over time to every single target every one second. That's one tick of a Zerblite every one second to all targets. Also, if you check your skills, this is damage over time. So that's another one tick every one second. This is as well because of the bleed. And if you get an axe bleed from the passives. So we're now potentially up to four ticks if we get the bleed as well. The... Dawnbreaker, if you did that, would be another tick, but we don't have to do that. In fact, we won't do that. So we'll stick with four seconds right now. Four ticks, even. The two poison dots that we have on our weapon is two more dots. So we're up to six. We'll go back into some more skills. Volley, every one second, we're up to seven. Caltrops, every one second, we're up to eight. Hurricane, every one second, we're up to nine. Nine ticks every one second on the single target and six in air of effect because obviously the poisons and the, the beast trap are not for aoe so we've got nine ticks every one second and this fires every half a second so that's another two we've got 11 ticks in one second and we need 20 ticks to make the target explode so when you are on your rotation and it is kind of at its peak you can make that explosion happen in two seconds flat, have a two second cooldown, and then instantly reapply it. This is guaranteed to explode. Every single target. Your main target will fire even quicker. This is stupid. Absolutely stupid. So what you need to do is keep up your rotation and everything will go boom. Now as far as traits and such are concerned, sharpened on the front, infused on the back. Poisons. Weapon and spell damage glyph. Divines on everything. Weapon damage on everything on the jewelry with two bloodthirsty and one infused. Now the choices where you can swap out. If you want more single target, Reliquin will give you a single target one second ticking damage over time. And you can keep this up indefinitely if you can keep up your light attacks if you're experienced enough. And this will give you increased crit chance making you go over 50%. It will give you extra damage output for the 5% increase to dungeons, trials, and, and uh, arenas. And if you can do it, this will keep up the ticks and make a Zerblight fire on single target as well and do more damage. Versus Aegis, you're talking about anywhere between 5 to 7k extra DPS on single target. But you will lose one of your major dots in error of effect and one of your major error of effect damage outputs. So that's the sacrifice. Error of effect, this is absolutely insane and will annihilate everything. Single target, if you're capable, this will hit harder. But just bear in mind what you're going to lose. If you lose more explosions, you actually end up with less on the single target anyway. So it's a balance thing. It's a choice that you can make. However, if you don't have access to trials, you don't have access to Maelstrom, because you haven't done it yet maybe, or you're not lucky enough to get the bow, and you don't actually do that well in VDSA, don't worry. Now, if you don't have either of these two weapons, you can, of course, use agility for the time being. You won't have this beneficial uh, damage output for area of effect, kind of direct damage from your carve. And you won't have the increase to volley. So that's something you'll have to consider. But it will give you a flat bonus to your max stamina, which will contribute to your overall DPS regardless, just for the time being. However, if you want to go a little more optimal and you want to get very close to this damage output but you don't have maelstrom and you don't have vdsa and you are struggling with them you can of course go azure blight battle axe on the front azure blight bow on the back and that will keep up 100 percent uptime of azure blight as far as you can you'll keep up your agus because it's all on your body anyway and your helmet and shoulders can be changed to krog this will require you to alter your champion points and you'll have to remove 1.4 um, K physical penetration so that you can then plug it somewhere else because otherwise you'll overpen. Or maybe you won't, depends on who you're with. But this will offer a frontal AoE damage over time, rapidly firing dot actually, every three seconds, which will contribute to this explosion. So while you may not have the Maelstrom weapon and the Master's weapon, which will lessen your overall, you can use a Zer on both bars 
and use a monster set that will help make it explode more often. So you'll be close. So to recap, if you don't have these, agility on both and you'll be fine. Or if you want to push that a little bit extra, a Zerblight on both and then put on the Krag's monster set. However, if you want to go up to Obviously, you've seen what there is to offer. Now, champion points. Very straightforward. 72 points into here to give us a 23% reduction to direct damage. 64 and 64 to give us a 13% reduction to all damage. Um, types apart from Oblivion, of course. And 19%, which is 51 points into here for dot reduction. We do have other passives here that we've unlocked, but those are explained in a video linked in the description about champion points. They're very important. 19 points into quick recovery to give us an extra healing receive bonus. That includes the heals that we do because once we do the heal, we technically receive it and that can enhance it. Plus other people's too that we get from them. 44 into Warlord to reduce the cost of break free. 75 into Nacity, pay very close attention to this, to increase the return we get back from our heavy attacks. This is currently different on PTS. It says light attacks. That is not reflective of live right now. This is for your heavy attacks at the moment, and it's a 14% bonus. Just bear that in mind. And 75 into Mooncalf to increase our stamina recovery. 72 into Tumbling to reduce the cost of Dodge Roll, which is going to help us a lot. 4 points into Shadow Ward just to give us a tiny bonus of something that we can take, because we're not going to use these points anywhere else. And for using 75 points in this tree, again, explain more in the Champion Points video, we have the Treasure Hunter passive. Nothing in here. 66 into Master of Arms to increase our direct damage. We are doing a lot of direct damage from our main rotation as far as our Spambles are concerned on the front bar. Plus, Azure Blight is also direct damage when it goes boom. That is going to help a lot. And this increases our light and heavy attack damage. That's going to help also alongside of our Bound Aegis for now on live, of course, and our Empower from our Wreck and Blow. We do have a lot of damage over time, so 48 points in here is actually really helpful. Although damage over time is used a lot, we're not trying to escalate too much of that damage, we're trying to focus on as much direct as possible for the explosions, but we do want the damage over time ticks, and while they're running, we will take advantage of them and increase them a little bit. This increases all of our crit damage and crit healing that we do. That's going to help us a lot on survival and damage output, and of course, forcing some of our procs. 35 points into piercing. We are using a sharpened weapon, so we don't need much into here. This will give us the, the kind of gap closer that we need. If you're in trials and you want to get the resistance of the target down, via penetration values or um, resistance removal, if you like, you need 18200 in terms of pen and um, resistance removal. We actually can hit that on the nose with all buffs and bonuses applied with our setup that we've got now. So we've got the sharpened weapon, which covers a large gap of it, and we've also got this here. 49 into mighty to increase all of the damage that we're doing because we're doing pretty much all physical, but if you have any disease damage, which does come from a Zerblight, or poison damage from our poisons, this will obviously increase that. So that helps as well. Now, one more swap out, of course. You can still use the Master's Bow if you prefer. This is primarily just to increase single target damage, and it will reduce your area of effect effectiveness. So there is a, a big difference in design there if you choose to use this. But you can. You can use Reliquin and Master's Bow together, and you'll get an increased amount of damage for that single target fight. But... Just bear in mind, of course, if you do that, you are going to need to change your skills and you're going to need to take Caltrops off and replace it with Poison Injection. That is a choice. I wouldn't recommend it because the damage output is absolutely fine and the error effect is nuts. But if you want to, you can. You'll get that little bit extra out of it. Maybe it's a single target fight and there are no adds ever, which is extremely rare, but the choice is yours. Now, rotation. We're going to explain this very simply because this is not difficult at all. There are two variations to it. If you choose to use your daggers, then the rotation is pretty much the same as it always ever was. But if not, it's even easier. So keep your beast trap down at all times. Keep your crit surge up as much as you possibly can. Now, when you first start, you want to keep your AoEs up as quickly as you can. You want volley down, you want hurricane on, and you want caltrops on. And then you swap bars. Then you want to light attack carve. So in area of effect, enemies get hit with bleed from that skill and potentially from the, the passive. Then you want to light attack, wreck and blow six times. So one, two, three, four, five, six. If you are slow with your rotations, you want to turn that into five. Because then the back bar dots won't fall off so often or so quickly. Once you finish your last Wreck and Blow, Light Attack, Beast Trap, Swap Bars. That's it. 
that's all you ever need to do. Now, the variations to it. If you can keep on top of your bound Aegis, bound armaments even, then before you swap bars at the end, you're going to have to take off one Reckon Blow, by the way. So we're down to four now. You do this. One, two, three, four. Light attack, daggers, light beast trap swap. When you're on your back bar, you will then have your volley, which I won't put on the target at the moment because it'll spoil stuff. You'll have your light attack hurricane, light attack caltrops, light attack daggers swap bar. So, at the end of the rotation, you light attack, fire it before your beast trap and swap. So light daggers, light beast swap. On the back bar, once you've done your caltrops, light attack, daggers, swap bars again. You can repeat that over and over and over if you really want to. But honestly, the damage output is about the same and sometimes less. Because it's disallowing you the extra in power, it's not allowing you the extra wrecking blow. The gap filler, the damage that you're losing, is the daggers alone. That can crit or not crit per individual dagger. So can sometimes be higher or lower than what you're doing. And can add complication. So if you don't want to activate the daggers at all, you can just take the passive bonus from bound armaments and never actually use it. And sometimes it makes the rotation so much more fluent, you don't need to actually press it. Now, if you're on single target, you might want to. If you're focusing on fully pushing as much area of effect as possible, it's not necessary. And you can just keep the passives. So, take into account that we may not be using the daggers for their damage output and we're just using them for their passives. There's one more change you may need to do. Instead of doing this, light attack spam over and over and over. You may want to change that to this. The situation for that is if there's not just one target and there are multiples, that's when you want to hit this because it will get stronger per target. And you can use that as your spam ball instead. So instead of light attack, wreck and blow five times or six if you can keep up with it, you want to use this instead. Light spin, light spin, light spin. That is stronger than your wreck and blow spamming if you have multiple targets for every target you're actually hitting. One more thing to consider is at the end, when the health is below, I would say between 30 and 25%, maybe about 25 actually, you change your wreck and blow spam to this. Because that's your execute. Just make sure, of course, you don't miss your first initial card. So to recap, we'll do this once more. Always have your beast trap down, always have your buff up. Volley, light, hurricane, light, caltrop, swap. Light carve. We'll do five. One, two, three, four, five. Light beast trap, swap. Light volley, light hurricane, light caltrop, swap. Now, like I said, you don't have to change that at all. Wreck and blow can be changed for carve if it loads your enemies. Execute when the health is low. If you can get six wreck and blows in and you're not losing too much time on your overall dots on the back bar, that's fine. If you do find you're a little slow on it, five is probably better for you. Depends on the person. But here is the fun part. This over here is your single target. If you hit that over and over and over, you may see results that you like. You may not. But in a fight where there is perhaps a boss and adds, or maybe just adds, this is what you can expect to see. And if you are running a relatively old PC, for example, you might want to turn down your graphics for this. So we will just use Carve instead of Wreck and Blow because we've got multiple ads as our spammable. And I will just do the rotation as normal. There are 14 target skeletons here. You might not always get 14 ads. Sometimes you get one, sometimes you get two, sometimes you get three, sometimes you get 10. It depends on the content. But for argument's sake, on an extreme setting, let's do this.
There's 14 target skeletons killed in 53 seconds. Who said AoE was dead? It's nuts. Every single one of them that takes damage blows up and hits the others. So, this is the situation that you need to pay attention to. Your tank needs to stack these up. Stack the adds. Also, one more very important thing to note. If you are using this set and someone else in your group is using this set, they do not stack as such, but they do make things go a bit nuts. So what they do instead of stacking is every single damage over time tick that you do and every single damage over time tick that they do contributes to the stack, which means this can fire faster. Instead of once every four seconds with two seconds of stacking and two seconds of downtime, this can actually end up firing every three seconds. So that escalates like hell. So if you have another person in your group using Cleave, for example, or you have another one in your group using Nature's Bounty, these bounce off each other and things die a lot, lot faster. Really good example for that, by the way, in an extreme situation. A fear in Archive Hard Mode. If your tank is holding the axes close to the boss and their Storm Atronarchs are close to the boss, you have multiple adds to scale this damage off of and they all go boom and hit the main boss. Also, because the axes have so much more health than the mage, the closer they are, if you can manage it, the better. You've basically got infinite free AoE damage using those axes as bombs. Play smart, understand your mechanics, and you're good to go. So, first of all, thank you all very much for watching. Hopefully that helped. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of how to approach this particular build. Remember, there are choices. Go back into the gear section if you're confused. Now, of course, thank you very, very much for watching. I hugely appreciate your support. If you are not subscribed already, please do hit that button. That is free. Furthermore, if you want to help support outside the channel, there are some links in the info section for Patreon, Twitter, Facebook, and of course the website zynodegaming.com, where all the written guides are, including this one. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.